from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual Life and Casualty Company. Oh, hello, Harry. What's with you? John, I have a case I'd like you to handle for us. It's, uh, well, it's somewhat unusual. Have you ever handed me one that wasn't completely screwy? I said unusual. And I said screwy. So now that we understand each other, what's it all about? Well, absolutely nothing yet. Uh, but I'm very apprehensive about one of our clients. Oh, Harry, you're the biggest worry worn I ever knew. Uh, what was that? I said, who is this client? Oh, uh, Dr. Walter Merrill. Merrill? The scientist? That's right. Nobel Prize winner? The man who worked out the molecular orbital contraction, something or other? Yes, yes, that's the one. As I say, John, I'm worried. Well, who wouldn't be about him? I'll be right down to see you. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Life and Casualty Insurance Company in Philadelphia, where else? Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the clever chemist matter. Expense of transportation and incidentals, Hartford to New York to Philadelphia. I didn't even stop to check my bag, but headed directly for the Philly Mutual building on Walnut Street. Harry Branson is a good insurance man, but a great worrier. Nonetheless, he'd given me some pretty important too. too. And after all, what do we live for? Hey, I keep the change. Thanks, Doc. John? John, what took you so long? Oh, now, what's the matter, Harry? Forget to pay the rent on your office or just forgot the key? No, John, as a matter of fact, I have the key right... <clears throat> this is hardly the place for levity. Well, surely you haven't been waiting here on the sidewalk ever since you called me. No, I haven't, but by checking plane schedules, I was able to determine when you'd arrive almost to the minute and not wanting to waste time taking you upstairs to the office. Pretty urgent matter, huh? Which boy, you should be here shortly. What? Well, now, usually I arrange these things myself, Harry. Yes, and how we pay... Of you. Oh, Harry, you touch me to the quick. Oh, now, please don't misunderstand me. I I don't mean that there's ever anything really dishonest about you your don't. expense account. Well, it's you only... ought to. Believe me, I'll pad it to the hill if I think I can get away with it. Anyway, the most important reason for engaging the car was so that you can leave immediate... Malaga? Yes, New Jersey. It's a... oh, is that where Dr. Merrill is? Yes. As is his custom, he chooses to work in some isolated spot where he can't possibly be disturbed. Uh, he and his colleague, that is. Colleague? I always heard that he worked alone, freelance. And you heard right. However, he now has a professor, Theodore Nash, with him. Nash? One of our... According to Dr. Merrill. Never heard of him. John, they're working together on what I'm sure is some top secret project. Oh. Oh, say, so wait. Didn't Merrill have something to do with the early rocket experiments? Precisely. Which is why I suspect their present work may have something to do with the space satellite or intercontinental missiles or something of the sort. Yeah, possible. But what has all this got to do with you? Their insurance. Dr. Merrill has had a policy with us for some years. $25,000. Oh, and probably he took out a policy for 10000 Beneficiary? Nash made Dr. Merrill his beneficiary. Oh, well, that sort of thing is often done between men working together. Harry, you know that. Yes, yeah, so that if anything happens to one, the other will be financially able to carry on what they've started. Sure, right. Which is no doubt why Dr. Merrill changed the beneficiary of his policy to Theodore Nash. So, what's the worry? No sooner was the change made than I received a letter of protest from Dr. Merrill's daughter. Who's she? Uh, Mrs. Howard Harding, she and her husband live in West Philadelphia. He, he's a welder for an aviation company, I think. Well, what did she base her protest on, Harry? She claims her father must have been coerced into changing the policy. Oh, now, wait a minute. That sounds like the hungry relative who complains about being cut out of the will. It might. If Mrs. Harding weren't a perfectly well-balanced, intelligent, and I'm sure quite unselfish person, a completely... Uh, un... Is she good-looking? Well, yes. And uh, real sweet to you? Yes, she is. A, well, now, John, I don't know what you're trying to imply. Uh, they do it every time. John. Particularly when there's a bit of money involved. Good-looking insurance broker like you. And you're a bachelor, too, aren't you, Harry? <laughs> John, you're pulling my leg. Oh, Harry. But then I guess we're all suckers for someone like that. That has nothing to do with it. I've had these hunches before, John, and they've always been right. Even you will have to admit that. Yeah. Yeah, I'll confess that in the cases I've handled for you so far... Why don't you call up Dr. Merrill? 
I think the quaint old fellow would die rather than have a phone near enough to disturb him in his work. Oh, oh, there's your rental car waiting at the curb. So off you go, John, and see what you can find out. Okay, Harry. It all sounds like a lot of nothing you're worried about, but as long as you're willing to pay for it. And I always did like South Jersey this time of year. I drove across the Delaware River Bridge into Jersey and headed for Route 45 to Westville, Woodbury, and finally Pittman, where I picked up Route 47. What Harry had said was true. These hunches of his had a remarkable way of panning out. And yet, oh, who was I to complain? After a pleasant hour's drive through cranberry bog and farm country, through miles of orchards and the intoxicating odor of the peach blossoms, I pulled into the quiet little town of Malaga. Population, oh, I'd say around 500. First stop, the post office. Uh, Dr. Merrill? Yeah, sure. You go back the way you came, about a mile, till you say, you see the name Wampus Bung. Wampus what? Wampus means cat. Bung, bungalow. Wampus Bung. I, uh, yeah. Yeah, the doctor and the professor got the fourth cottage beyond it. White one with a fence around it. Yeah, good, thanks. And if you don't mind, you can uh, take their mail out to them. They haven't been in to pick it up for five days now. Oh, Nothing wrong, is there? Well, who'd know? The way those two keep to themselves, well, you'd think whatever they're working on was the atomic bomb. Yeah, well... Just to be sure, you let them know that you're at the gate now before you try to go through the fence. Oh, what's that supposed to mean? The professor sees you prowling around. He's liable to take a shot at you. As I drove back and toward the edge of Little Malaga Lake, the idea of getting shot at by anyone living in this peaceful, quiet place seemed ridiculous. The lake itself, by the way, looked pretty inviting. I made a mental note to come back here on my own sometime after the fishing season opened. As the postmaster had indicated, the fourth cottage beyond Wampus Bung was heavily fenced in. So I gave notice of my arrival. <laughs> I had barely left the car when the door of the little cottage opened. Yes? Who, who is it? Dr. Merrill? Oh, oh yes. My name is Dollar, sir. Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. Harry Branson? Yes, sir, that's right. Harry Branson sent me down here to see you. Oh, uh, come in, come in. Uh, I'm most most glad to see you. Uh, please, come into the house. All right, thank yes. you. Is uh, Professor Nash here? In the, uh, in the laboratory. But please, As come As he spoke, into the, the sliding house. door on the garage at the side of the house opened. A rather swarthy man stepped out, quickly closed the door, and threw a heavy bolt on it. Then looked over toward us suspiciously. Yes, because it's better that you and I talk in, in private, alone. Doctor, who is that? Yeah. Oh. oh, yes, Professor. If we have a visitor, why do you not bring him here where we can both speak to him? Oh, oh, yes, yes, of course. This is Mr. Johnny Dollar. Professor Theodore Nash. Mr. Dollar? I do, Professor. I'm from your insurance company. Just uh, making a little routine checkup. Oh, fine, fine. I'm very glad to see you. As a matter of fact, I wish to talk with you. <laughs> How do you do? Now, come into the laboratory. Professor, do you, do you think it wise? Oh, of course, Doctor. Since he is not a man of science, I'm sure there is no harm in his seeing it. And... You have an experiment going, remember? But I wish to Mr. speak Dollar, to him Mr. Dollar, within these four walls, the genius of Dr. Merrill and my own poor efforts are creating things that will startle the world. Outside, the small building looked like an ordinary two-car garage, someone in need of paint and repair. But inside, it was immaculate and loaded with scientific equipment of all shapes and sorts and sizes. There were racks of test tubes, bottles of chemicals, beakers, a centrifuge... Machines and apparatus I'd never seen before, that I imagine much of the world never dreamed of. And all of it as neat as a pin, not so much as a stirring rod out of place. Ah, look, Doctor. The polymerization step is almost complete. Eh? Now, you must continue the molecular balance check immediately. Oh. Oh, yes, yes. And you must both leave me. This must not be seen by... by anyone. Now, we understand, oh. Doctor. We understand. I hope you will pardon me, Miss... Mr. Dollar? Yes, of course, Doctor. Oh, come, Mr. Dollar. Yes, I, I will lock the door. Yes. He, uh, he does require privacy, doesn't he? Yes. Oh, hey, you're not going to bolt that door, are you? Oh, 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 of course not. <laughs> Force of habit, I guess. 
Oh, it is he who keeps things locked so tightly when he's working. Unnecessarily so. But... Then uh, genius is permitted his idiosyncrasies, huh? Harry Branson seems to think you two may be working on something to do with guided missiles. Uh, very perceptive man. But that is something we must not speak about. Now, <clears throat> why have you come here, Mr. Dollar? Well, like I said, just a routine checkup. We, uh, we usually do this when a sizable policy has changed. Oh, there is something unusual about two men working together on important things, ensuring in each other's favor? Well, no. Uh, but when his daughter perhaps objects... You know Dr. Merrill's daughter? Oh, I know about her and about her unfortunate marriage to that, uh, that day laborer. Nothing wrong with day labor, Professor? Yeah, but one who waits for a great man like the doctor to die so that he can get his hands on the insurance money. You think that's why his daughter objected to the change? Of course. But his money will be used to further his work. By me. And, of course, for the good of humanity. I uh, see. Well, how soon do you think the doctor will be through with this experiment? An hour, perhaps two. And then he will call me in to assist him with the next the crucial step. Uh, but now, about now, Look, insurance. why don't I run in town, arrange for a place to stay, grab a bite to eat, and then come back here? Huh? If you like. I'm sorry we have no room in the cottage. No, I don't give it a second thought. I'll see you later. Something of Harry Branson's hunch had passed on to me. A strange feeling about the whole setup. There was something wrong about both Merrill and Nash, particularly the latter. Something I couldn't quite put my finger on. Was Dr. Merrill afraid of Nash? I don't know. Item two, a dollar even for a quick bite in a little cafe along the highway after I'd made arrangements for a room for the night in a private home. It was not much over an hour later when I drove back to the little cottage by the lake. And then I heard it. Someone pounding on the door of the laboratory from the inside. Someone calling for help. Professor! But the lock's on the inside! Turn the lock! What? Bolt here on the... Oh, what are you... Oh. Oh, thank you, man. Good Lord, Professor, what happened to you? You look like you've been run over by... Dr. Merrill. Too late. Too late. Professor, what happened here? He beat me. Threw acid at me. The doctor? No, the, the man... Then he killed the doctor with a gun. He killed him. Who, oh, Professor, who? I, I, I don't know. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. Democracy. To the many who have lived under tyranny, democracy comes as a guiding light, shining on a brighter future. That is because democracy stands for the establishment of government conceived from deep thought and free choice, rather than being based on accident and force. It is also normal that the free choice of a democratic government happens because people who choose their own government are directed by true interests in the welfare of mankind. Democracy has been proven to be mankind's greatest legacy of freedom. Now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Clever Chemist Matter. Expense account item three, ten dollars for the services of one Dr. Frederick Foote, the only resident medico in the little town of Malaga, New Jersey. After pronouncing Dr. Walter Merrill dead, he took the badly beaten Professor Nash to his office clinic. While waiting for Nash to get in good enough shape to talk, I ran up item four, ten cents, phone call to the sheriff, who promised to come over as soon as he could enlist the aid of the nearby state police. Finally, Dr. Foote gave the word. But I suggest you talk with him as little as possible, Mr. Dollar. In pretty bad shape, huh, Dr. Foote? The intruder not only beat him severely, but threw a bottle of acid in his face. Oh? Professor Nash will never have the use of his left eye again because of that nitric acid. Has Nash said anything that might help us identify the assailant and killer? No. Now, uh, please don't talk with him too long. Uh, Professor? Yes? 
Yes. Hello, Professor. Oh, Mr. Dollar. I will never see again with my left eye. He has told me. Yes, I know. I'm sorry. But the great Dr. Merrill, he is dead. What a loss. Professor. <laughs> Professor, tell me, did you see the man who attacked you? Yes. Can you describe him at all? Yes, you know, young, not more than 30, five feet, six or eight, very heavy, yes. stocky, and black curly hair. Yeah. Hands like a working man, a laborer. Come Have you ever seen this man before? No, I... <coughs> oh, here. <coughs> Some water. Thank you, thank you. Do you know why he came in and attacked you and Dr. Murray? No. Was he after something there in the laboratory? No, only to kill Dr. Merrill. I tried. I tried to defend him. I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but I think that's enough. Yes, yes, okay, Dr. Foote. I think I've heard enough. <laughs> I managed to get back to the cottage by the lake before the police arrived and came up with one very damning piece of evidence. In one of the bedrooms, I found a picture of a wedding couple. It was inscribed, Love to the dearest father in the world. And next to the bride stood a man who answered perfectly the description Professor Nash had just given me. The husband of Dr. Merrill's daughter, Howard Harding. And then I, I thought of what Nash had said about Harding. His antagonism, his conviction that Harding was the one who resented the change in the insurance policy. But there was something else, too. That had happened when I talked with Nash in the doctor's office that... Hmm. By the time I got back to the laboratory, the sheriff and state police arrived. The sheriff, I'm afraid, must up any prints that might have been left on the bottle of acid. However, in the weeds outside, a state trooper found the pistol, a 38 caliber Luger that had killed Dr. Merrill fingerprints had apparently been wiped off, but the gun was carefully... fingerprints. Before taking off in a mad dash back to Philadelphia, I stopped at Dr. Foote's and picked up one water tumbler. Item 5, 370 for a tank full of gas. Item 6, 50 cents. Parking in Philadelphia as close as possible to Harry Branson's office. John, what have you found out about Dr. Merrill? Harry, he's dead. Well, oh, dear. Now listen, write down the address of Mr. and Mrs. Howard Harding for me. His daughter, does she know? No, she doesn't know yet, and I hope I can avoid telling her before I write it down, will you, man? Well, yes, of course, Take but this. I... Don't unwrap it, but see that it gets to Ray Kemper at the Federal Bureau fast. I'll check with him about it later, thanks. But, now, John... Harry, this is one time this expense account of mine is going to save you a lot of money. I think. I don't know how many red lights I skipped on the drive out to West Philadelphia, but I felt like a hound dog in a hot scent. The home of Mr. and Mrs. Howard Harding turned out to be in a nice, quiet residential area. I was met at the door by the girl in the wedding picture. A tall, very nice-looking blonde in her late 20s. Oh, yes? Mrs. Harding? I'm Terry Harding. Well, I'm Johnny Dollar from your father's insurance company. Oh, good. Come in. Perhaps you can help me make him do something about that policy of his. Well, uh, that isn't exactly... Someone has poisoned Daddy's mind, Mr. Dollar. Oh, what do you mean? It isn't that I need the money if Daddy dies, which heaven forbid. No, it doesn't exactly look as though you do. No, of course we don't. Howard's been doing so wonderfully at Colonial Aviation. Yes, apparently. And I'd had a notion he was just a laborer or something. Oh, dear, no. That's what Daddy called him because... Well, because he wasn't too fond of Howard. And that is the way Howard started before we were married. But now he's one of the officers of the company. Uh, where is he, Mrs. Arnie? Well, as a matter of fact, I thought you were Howard when you drove up just now. He's been fishing. Fishing? On some little lake over in Jersey. He goes every Saturday all by himself. Malaga Lake? No, Malaga's where Daddy was. Mm-hmm. He and that... That what, Mrs. Harding? Well, I... I don't know. It's Howard, I guess. What do you mean? Howard has never liked or trusted him, even though they've never actually met. When Daddy changed his insurance to name that professor... There is something wrong about that man, Mr. Dollar. What, Mrs. Harding? I don't know. Daddy always worked alone until he came along. Daddy's such an alert, bright-eyed little busybody in spite of his Wait age. A that Your father... Like a cute little wound-up spring, hopping about like a... Mrs. Harding. Yes? Mrs. Harding, when I saw your father... You've seen Daddy. Well, then you know what I he mean. He was tired. 
Almost in a daze, he spoke with difficulty. Oh, no, you're mistaken. He chatters away like a jaybird. He... What is it, Mr. Dollar? Oh, he must have been doped. He looked as though... Hi, honey. Well, I'm just as lousy a fisherman as usual. Not a single... Oh, excuse me. Mr. Harding, just tell me one thing. Well, that depends. Who are you? Mr. Dollar's from the insurance company, darling. Not Johnny Dollar. Yeah, that's right. Well, I've certainly heard of you. Uh, tell me... No, you tell me, Harding. Where have you been? Why, fishing. Where? Over in Jersey. Where in Jersey? Little private lake. Where? Over near Mount Holly. One place I know of where nobody else ever goes, where I can get rid of the cobwebs at my job. Hey, wait a minute, Dollar. What is this? Harding, you've been identified as the man who murdered Dr. Walter Merrill. What? Murdered? I'm Did sorry, I... Mrs. Harding. I'm sorry, but it's true. What are you talking no. about, Dollar? You didn't know about it? Of course not. How could I? Where did it happen? How? At his place in Malaga. Oh. Professor Nash. I'll kill that man. You'll take it easy. You seem to forget that so far you're the only suspect in the case. You're out of your mind. If it was anybody, it was that Nash. Never have trusted that man. And the insurance policy. If anybody killed Dr. Merrill, it was that professor. Now listen to me. Nash was with Dr. Merrill when he was killed there in his laboratory. Of course he was. But Nash was attacked also, beaten. Acid thrown at him. He lost the sight of one eye because of it. And I tell you... You sure? Yes, of course I'm sure. It was I who found them. Nash beating against the inside of the door of that laboratory, crying for help. A door that was bolted on the outside. But, Dollar, I... You're sure of that? I'm sure. Well, I still think... Oh, Terry, I'm sorry, honey. Here, let me... Howard, it's so terrible. Better answer that phone, Howard. Yeah. Hello? Yes. Oh, yes. It's uh, for you, Mr. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Terry, here. come on. You've got to pull yourself together. Johnny Dollar. Right. John, this is Harry Branson. I just received a call from Mr. Kemper at the Federal Bureau. Yes. He says he must see you immediately. Call him back, Harry. Tell him I'll be there in 15 minutes. Harding, just to keep things straight, I wouldn't leave this house if I were you. Well, now, wait a minute, just Dollar. Just sit tight. I think you're in the clear. More red lights got passed up on my way into the Philadelphia offices of the Bureau. So Ray Kemper felt that whatever he'd found was important. If so, it would back up one of my suspicions. But in view of the circumstances, that bolted door in the laboratory, for instance, how could it? Important is putting it mildly, Johnny. The prints you found on the water glass, Ray. Three sets. One, yours. Yeah, well, naturally. Two, uh, Dr. Frederick Foote, who is currently practicing medicine. I know, I know, in the town of Malaga, New Jersey. That's where the glass came from. Oh, but the third set of prints. Yes, I had to go into the international file for them. And Johnny... Nash? Theodore Nash? Nash. Nashevsky. What? Theodore Nashevsky. Chemist from one of our not-so-friendly countries. Huh? Expert on explosives. One time, he was thought to have attempted to enter this country. That was in 1940. Ray, have you got any pictures on him? Plenty. From the time he was a kid. Uh, here. Tell me how you picked up these prints. The beard in this picture. That looks like him, all right. Yeah, this too, with a shaved head. Almost as though he tried to keep changing his appearance. Johnny, Wait a sec, wait a sec. This picture of him as a youngster, this eye patch on his left eye. Our dossier is pretty complete. He was quite an athlete until he injured that eye. But it doesn't show in these other pictures, and he hasn't a glass eye. No, his eye always looked perfectly natural. Now, Johnny, if you have information... Ray, this has done it for me, thanks. Hey, now, just a minute. I'll see you. Hey, Johnny! This is Kemper. Give me a man to tail Johnny Dollar. All the way back to Malaga, New Jersey, I hoped my rental car would hold together. It did, in spite of the fact I pushed it all the way. International intrigue is a bit out of my line, but this time, so help me, I was beginning to feel like an FBI man. I stopped at state police headquarters along the way, and according to them, Nash was off the hook. Not only because of the acid thrown in his face, but even more important, because of my own testimony that I'd found them locked in that laboratory. I stopped again at the lab. Nothing. Then back to Dr. Foot's office. Very well, Mr. Dollar. When they arrive, I'll insist that they wait for you. All right, thanks, Doctor. Well, Professor, you're sitting up. Oh, have they found anything, Mr. Dollar? Have they found the man who attacked us and killed poor Dr. Merrill? Professor, I think I have. Oh? But tell me something. Yes, of course. Your, uh... Your government doesn't pay you very well, does it? Merrill and I were not working for the government, Mr. Dollar. Although, of course, the results of our work... I'm talking about your government, your own real boss. 
I do not understand. No doubt it's very much interested in anything this country develops in the line of guided missiles, that sort of thing. Mr. Dahl. Now, let me go on. Merrill was doing important work. Stuff that would be of great value to any country in the world. Of course. Your country would have paid you well for the results of his work. But, brother, they'll never get it. I do not know what you are talking Money, about. Money, the loot from Merrill's insurance, sure. Sure, it was enough to get you out of here after you'd gained the knowledge you need of Merrill's work. See here, Dollar. After you'd killed him, before he could give to his country, the United States, what he'd invented. You are a he fool. Co- I was beaten, The poor too. old man put up a pretty stiff fight, didn't he? Do you think I would have done this to myself? You My gave eyes... yourself away earlier when you reached out for a glass of water I handed you right here in this room. A man who'd lost his sight in one eye would have lost his aim until he got used to it. Funny, though, it didn't come to me until You later. are mad. You haven't seen out of that left eye since you were a kid. I tell you, you are mad. And a little acid burn to make it look like somebody had thrown it at you would be well worth the alibi it gave you. Feodor. Feodor. That's right, Feodor Nashevsky. Uh, listen to me. You, you were the one who found us locked in the door, bolted from the outside. You found us. Yeah. Also the cord, the string you used to pull the bolt to. That you looped over the bolt and pulled after you got inside. You couldn't have. I dropped it in the vat of acid. Yeah. Thanks. I was bluffing. But I made a lucky guess. What? <laughs> oh, what a brain. Nashevsky, I'm sure glad you're not working on our side. <laughs> The capsule he fished out of his pocket never got to his mouth. And I'm afraid he won't see very well out of his other eye for a while. My knuckles still hurt. And it was lucky for him that the police arrived. I'm afraid I don't like guys like him. Expense account total, including all the incidentals I could think of, and transportation back to Hartford, eighty-four thirty-five. Remarks? Well, don't beef on this one, Harry. The criminal, in spite of being the name beneficiary, doesn't get paid. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a real close look at a little-known but very dramatic side of Hollywood. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Duff. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Harry Bartell, Howard McNear, Forrest Lewis, Jack Crucian, Russell Thorson, Frank Gersel, and Bob Bruce. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.